with you entitled Stewarding the Miracle. And this is a word that uh, has been just brewing in my spirit for a long time. And I sure didn't think I was going to cry this soon, but here we go. (laughs) I've been walking a miracle out in my life for 15 years now. And uh, I've learned a lot of stuff along the way. I've learned a lot about what not to do, uh, probably more so of what not to do than what to do. But I don't necessarily want to just tell you my story this morning. I want to tell you the revelation that I've learned in studying my way through how to steward my miracle. The definition of stewardship, and some of you guys will remember when Uncle B was here, he actually preached on stewarding. But I want to give a little spin off on it. The definition of stewardship being entrusted to care for something of great value, including protection, planning, and managing resources. That's what it means to steward something. I took that definition from Webster's, dictionary.com, and of course, Wikipedia. And I kind of put all three together. But in a kingdom, it has a special meaning. The definition doesn't change, but it has kind of a cool application, right? In a kingdom, when there is no active king, whether it's because the king has passed away or because he's out on a crusade or he's visiting another kingdom, whatever it is, whenever they are away from the kingdom, they will assign a steward the place of the throne. And their job as the steward in a kingdom is to manage the kingdom in the absence of of the king. They don't have any real authority. The kingdom does not belong to them, but they are charged with the well-being of the kingdom. The steward of the throne has no authority over the kingdom, like I said, but if the king should say pass away and he does not have an heir, and there's no one to take the throne, but the steward has done a good job, the royal authority can appoint the steward the king. And therefore, at that time, the responsibility of the kingdom is now his and his alone. He has full authority. That's important to understand because I think there's a beautiful depiction of stewardship in the Bible. And I want to read that. This is where our text comes from this morning. It's Matthew chapter 25, verse 14 to 29. But before we do that, would you guys just allow me to pray this morning? Lord, we love you. God, we're so grateful for the opportunity to come before you again and to worship together and to hear your words. God, I pray wholeheartedly that I would be able to step back behind your word this morning, God, that it wouldn't be something that I say that people hear, but Holy Spirit, it would be the work that you do on the inside of us that people hear, that they remember this morning. God, it's so sweet to be able to trust in you, Jesus, and today we do just that. Would you come through? This morning, would you bring revelation? Would you speak to our hearts? Would you bring the miracle that people need to see in their lives today? In Jesus' name, amen. So Matthew chapter 25 says this, and you'll know this as the parable of the talents or the parable of, in in my Bible, it says the bags of gold. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, 
I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went and put and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. And his master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received in back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him. He's, he's telling Another servant. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I've heard, I mean, I've heard a lot, a lot of sermons preached on this piece of scripture, talking about salvation, talking about the gift that you've received from God and what do you do with it whenever given to it, and none of those sermons I've heard, I believe, are, are false. I just want to throw a little spin on it this morning. I want to tell you the revelation I learned when I read stories like this in the Bible. The master gave his servants a piece of his wealth, a piece of his kingdom, and they were tasked with stewarding that wealth. They became the stewards of that piece of the kingdom that their master gave them. By our definition, they were given responsibility of, they were to manage it, they were to manage the resources used in growing it. That was their task. And we always focus on that third servant that didn't do anything, went and hid it in the ground, and, you know, you didn't do anything with what God gave you. Here, here's, here's a plot twist. Even he stewarded the piece of the kingdom he was given. All three of them were stewards. All three of them received the responsibility for that wealth. Now, I mean, you can be a good steward or you could be a bad steward. Or you could just be okay. That's your choice. Let me ask you this question. How many guys right now in your life would say that I am believing for a miracle? Let me see your hands. It doesn't matter what the miracle is. A miracle of healing. A mi How many guys need a new job? How many guys kind of need your job to pay you a little more? How many guys would like a miracle to go back in time and to invest into stocks right before the election? <laughs> the Dow jumped up like six billion points overnight, and I'm like, man, I missed it by that much. Bitcoin's like the highest it's ever been. I'm like, that's a made-up currency, and even that, whatever. <laughs> I know you guys are aware, I mean, my family is believing for a huge miracle in a major way. It's the desire to understand miracles. And why sometimes it seems that God heals and sometimes it seems he doesn't. Or sometimes he delivers and sometimes he doesn't or Sometimes he gives the job and sometimes he doesn't. It's the desire to understand why in 15 years of praying for a miracle, I had not seen any movement at all from God in this area. It was a desire to understand that, that this message was birthed from. And last time I preached, I actually preached kind of the part one of it. So this is kind of like a part two, I guess. And if you don't remember, then you should take better notes.
But the revelation of that first one actually first began that, that last message, and I'll sum it up just in a paragraph. But the revelation of that message began with a conversation between me and Luli. And her desire to understand, because she came to me one day and she said, I'm making your healing a priority in my prayer. She literally came to me and she didn't know it, but she was saying, I'm going to steward your miracle for you. And I just essentially told you the end of the message, so spoiler alert, but she told me, she said, a lot of people pray for a healing, and they say, God, heal me. How many guys have said that? God, heal me. God, heal my mama. Heal, heal my, my aunt. Heal my friend. How many guys have said that? What do we expect to happen when we pray that? We, we, we expect what? What you mean? Jesus already died on the cross. Jesus already took the stripes on his back. The work of your healing has already been done. What do we want Jesus to do? It already happened. And, and it's like whenever Luli told me that, and I'm like, I'm like, I'm receiving it, and I'm listening to her, and I go back, and I'm reading through the word, and I'm like, this is craziness to me because it's like, subconsciously, I feel like every time I prayed, Lord, would you heal my knees? Would you heal my shoulder? Would you heal, you know, my mom? It's like I'm asking him to just go ahead and crawl back up on the cross again. Could, could you just go do the work one more time? Because I still can't walk. That was the revelation of the last message that I preached. And this is one of the heaviest things I think I've ever heard from the Lord is that to be a steward is to accept responsibility for what the king has done. And if you want to see a miracle take place in your life, you need to take responsibility for what Jesus did. And that was went to the cross. I have to assume the responsibility for that sacrifice and steward that power, steward that action, steward that faith. Hold it until Jesus says, okay, it's yours. He's not going back to the cross. If he had to, there was no power in it to begin with. It's time for my body, it's time for my spirit, it's time for my job, it's time for my bank account to line up with the anointing that took place on the cross of Calvary. He doesn't have to do it again. It is now on me to steward that anointing. It is on me to hold on to take care of that sacrifice until Jesus says, all right, it's yours. How many miracles are recorded in the Bible, do you know? Over 160 miracles, bona fide miracles. Some of y'all were here. I hear you going, woo. Just so everybody who doesn't know, I'm like youth pastor through and through. Like, that's my vibe. I don't know if you could tell with like the oversized shirt and the, the clean Adidas shell toe classics. I got a haircut, faux hawked it. <laughs> Skibbity, I don't know, I don't want to do that. I'm so glad I got out of youth ministry before Skibbity Toilet Ohio or whatever it is. I love you guys and y'all are going to change the world, but please change your vernacular. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There, I, I think it'd be a miracle if we could understand anything they say. There are 160 bona fide miracles, over 160 recorded in the Bible, split down the middle. I mean, there's, 
There's 80 and 80, Old Testament to New Testament, give or take a few. Uh, you can attribute over 40 of those to Jesus himself in the word of God. And I've been hard-pressed to find a single example of one of those where a miracle took place without someone taking responsibility for the power of God. I'm going to paraphrase a couple of examples because I simply don't have time to read the entire stories of all these. And someone's alarm just went off. It means I'm out of time. Oh, yeah, that's why I said the thing about the youth pastor. When I was a youth pastor, I would drink water because I was out of shape. And when I did, I made my students go, woo! And it would prove two things. It would prove they were paying attention, and it would wake anybody else up that fell asleep. So you feel, feel welcome. You don't have to. But if you don't, I'm just kidding. So I'm going to paraphrase a couple of examples of when a miracle took place in the Word of God, and there was an example of a failed stewardship for that miracle and what happened. And then I'm going to share also some examples of stewardship that was successful. Let's talk about some successful stewardships of the miracle. How many of you guys have heard the story of Jericho? The walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Joshua was given the responsibility for bringing Israel, God's people, into the promised land. He was a very literal steward of God's people. And they're not given the biggest army in the land. Israel didn't have the biggest army. They didn't have the best weapons. In fact, they had been wandering through the wilderness for a long time. They were tired they were starving, and they just flat had bad attitudes. How many of you guys have ever gone on a road trip with your kids? Now think if you didn't have a car, and they had to walk. For 40 years. If you ask if we are there yet one more time, I will turn this pack around, and we will walk 40 years back. No way. But yet Joshua had to lead them through the city to the city, take them around the city after walking for 40 years, had to travel around the city every day for six days and then seven times on the seventh day, and they weren't allowed to say a word. And that's because Joshua had to hear them for 40 years. I think that's the funniest thing in the world. You read that story about Jericho, and God gives Joshua the plan and never said anything about telling them not to talk. But when Joshua told it to them, he said, and you better not say a daggum word about it. I better not even hear you complain one time. <laughs> Until I tell you it's okay to talk. And then when I do, you better scream as loud as you can. That's literally what Joshua told him. <laughs> Joshua stewarded that miracle because at the end of the seventh time around that city on the seventh day, the walls came down. And the people of God took their promised land. Yeah. The next example, Naaman. How many of you guys know Naaman? Naaman was the commander of a Syrian army. And the Bible says that he was extremely esteemed by the king. He was well favored by the king. I read it, he was famous. He was an important person. He was rich. He had the king's ear, so he had influence, right? He was a powerful, famous man, and he was probably a little uppity, if you know what I'm saying. He probably lived in River Ranch. <laughs> Didn't bother getting in a car to go get his coffee. He just got in the golf cart. And if that's any of you in here, it's fine as long as your name's not Naaman. <laughs> so, so you can imagine he was, he was a little, you know, uppity, right? And Naaman had a disease, and the disease was called leprosy. It was a skin disease. 
and it, it declared you kind of dirty. So think about a famous person that can't get around people. It's illegal to because he has a skin disease. Think about how hard it is to remain that famous figure in people's eyes. So the prophet Elisha, through, through a lot of story, right, and this is why I'm paraphrasing, the prophet Elisha told his, this army commander Naaman, this rich and famous guy, that if he wanted to be healed of his leprosy, he needed to go dip seven times in the Jordan River, okay? This commander's from Syria, and Naaman was kind of like me. He wanted to be healed, and he was asking to be healed, and he kind of had this expectation for what it meant to go to the man of God and be healed. What The picture he had in his mind was he goes to Elisha. Elisha comes out, and, and he's praying over Naaman, and he's, he's waving his hands like this. And how many of you guys have been to services like that? And they're like, in the name of Jesus! And they're, you're not getting slain by the Holy Spirit. You're getting knocked out by a right hook from the preacher. How many, have you ever been there? I'm a big dude. And I've planted several times. Because if I'm going to go down, it's the Holy Spirit. It ain't you, buddy. And I've gone down before, too. And I felt sorry for the guy behind me who had to catch me. <laughs> Naaman wanted this big, flashy thing waving the hands around and, and yelling out to the Lord, Lord, heal this man. And Elisha didn't even go talk to him himself. Elisha sent a servant to go tell Naaman to dip in the Jordan seven times. I told you Naaman was from Syria. They have beautiful water in Syria. It's blue. You can see the bottom of it and the fish swimming in it. The Jordan River was quite literally filled with raw sewage. Imagine being told to go dunk in a full-on sewer. Now, this is how you know he's not Cajun, because we have all swam in the Vermilion, and it's about the same thing. <laughs> but to Naaman, this was an insult. And he said, there's, there's much cleaner water where I'm from. Why can't I just go bathe in those waters? I'm not doing this. He didn't even come out and talk to me himself. No prayer at all. Naaman's servant got a hold of him, asked him to humble himself and to give it a try. So Naaman humbled, did that. He humbled himself. He went and washed in the dirty poo-poo water of Jordan River. And he was healed. But he had to do it seven times. And I wonder if he'd have stopped on the six and given up, if he'd have had any kind of difference at all. The paralyzed man on the mattress, Jesus was ministering to a family in a house, and a crowd began to, to gather, and it got huge. I mean, it just, it got huge. And there was a man who was paralyzed and he had four friends who put him on a mattress. They each picked up a corner, and they carried this man to Jesus to be healed. And when they got to the house, there was no way into the house because the, the crowd was so huge that they climbed up on top of the house, and they cut a hole in the ceiling, and they lowered him down to Jesus. This is crazy to me. Because this is long before, like, home insurance was a thing. <laughs> you know how desperate you would have to be to destroy someone's house? I mean, so Jesus heals the man. And this is beautiful to me. This is, this is, this is, this is where I'm at in my life. This is, like, the biggest revelation I've had. Jesus heals the man. And he tells him, now pick up your mattress, go home. The mattress that took four friends to carry. 
He has to now carry himself. His friends stewarded his miracle until he got to Jesus. And then Jesus said, now you must steward your miracle. This is where I find myself in my own personal healing. Because I don't know if you guys can know, I don't know if you can tell, but I can walk. And that's the highest I've jumped in 20 years. <laughs> and I'm at a place in my life to where I believe wholeheartedly through this revelation that Jesus said, I was healed over 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross and took those stripes on his back because that's what the word of God says. But for me, I have to figure out what it is that I got to do to steward that, that sacrifice to take responsibility for what Jesus did so that my miracle can be taking place right here today. That is, that is the revelation of how to steward a miracle. I wish I'd have asked permission to, to give examples of personal people that I know, but I know people in my life right now that were given some of the biggest miracles that I have ever seen in life. And I have seen a baby with, with an S curve in their back, literally seen hands laid on and the, the back was straight. I've, I, was, I was here to the, the pulpit when it happened. I saw it. And there are people in this room that you have received a miracle to that extent or even greater. And now Jesus is saying, pick up your mattress. Yes, I healed you. And you can stand up. Now pick up your mattress and go home. Oh, and by the way, he said, and sin no more. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> Just throwing it out there. Oh, good. You guys agree with that. Whew. That's the third reason why I made people do that. <laughs> Sometimes the cost of your miracle is paid by somebody else first. Who is it in your life that the Lord has called you to minister to, but maybe it's just been taking up so much time? How many days are you willing to give? How many times are you will, how many miles are you willing to carry that mattress so that your friend can be healed? How many times? I bet marching around Jericho was not fun. Or bathing in a dirty river or carrying a mattress with the dead weight of your paralyzed friend on it and then that paralyzed friend the first steps he takes in life, because the Bible says he was born paralyzed, the first steps he takes is to carry the same mattress home. And, I mean, it is kind of a funny sight to me, because I don't know if y'all know this, but I think that way. And I know that for the first time for me, <laughs> walking across the stage, uh, Celeste told me one day, she's like, do you feel yourself walking better? And I'm like, no, I feel like I'm walking like a baby deer. <laughs> because it, it's, I literally have to retrain myself how to walk. It's the weirdest thing. Because for so long I'm doing this when I walk. Or I'm on crutches. And it's like to walk normal, I literally have to remind myself, hey, you don't have to do this. There are times where I've literally been walking. I'm like, wait, hang on a second. No, you're healed. What are you doing? Like literally it, it has happened. And you'll see me. <laughs> You'll see me often coming up the stage. I'll, I'll look at the stairs, and I used to have to toe the line. And I'd go, Whew. and I'd step together, step together. And it's like I have to remind myself, you don't have to do that. And so I just, I walk up, and, and every time I feel like, oh, this feels weird. Like I feel like I'm kind of doing this. <laughs> and I, I have to imagine that's what the paralyzed man felt. He, he hasn't walked ever, and he, he hasn't even really, like, stood up yet. Because when you read the story, the religious people in there were really mad because Jesus didn't say, hey, be healed and go home. He said, hey, your sins are forgiven. 
And the religious people got upset and said, well, who are you to forgive sins? And Jesus said, well, what's harder, for me to forgive their sins or to tell them to pick up his mattress and go home? And he said, okay, then fine. You're healed. Pick up your mattress and go home. And I bet the dude did say, what now, huh? <laughs> I haven't even gotten up off the mattress yet. But he did, the Bible says. He got up. He picked up his mattress and he went home. Here's a couple of examples of when stewardship can fail. Samson, how many of you guys know Samson in the Bible? Strong dude. He was a man, but Samson was the man. He was blessed with a miracle of strength. He tore apart a lion with his bare hands. He killed 30 Philistines by himself and then turned around and wiped out a thousand Philistines with nothing but the jawbone of a donkey. And the list goes on. He was commanded to steward the miracle. Samson was a Nazarite and was promised that he would always have great strength so long as he kept that code, that vow, which was to abstain from wine and grape products, to never cut his hair as a sign that he was set apart for God and by not coming into contact with corpses or graves, like even family members who had passed away. But as we know the story, because it was preached a few weeks back, Delilah tempts him, and Samson, with all of his strength, had a weakness, and the weakness was for the love of a woman. And she cut his hair, and his miracle was forfeit. Samson lost his strength because he longed for the love of a woman more than he did his miracle. His strength left him, and he was captured by his enemy. There's a whole sermon there, and it's a great one, because like I said, it was preached a few weeks back. The point is, and there's, I mean, there's tons of examples that I'm skipping over. The rich man that Jesus said, sell everything you have and follow me. And he said no. And he turned around sad and he left Jesus. There's tons of examples in the Bible and I need to move on. But the point is this. Sometimes we don't see the miracles we're expecting to see. And we even blame God for maybe not being the miracle maker that we know him to be from the word of God. When in all actuality, maybe we aren't seeing our miracle because there's a period of stewarding that we have not engaged in yet. I got to be honest, there are times where my knees still hurt. I mean, I'm, I've been standing up here a long time, kind of a little sore. I mean, I did just jump like half an inch off the ground. I'm telling you, that was more like diagonal. <laughs> and there are times where, you know, I'd tell my wife, man, I'm really kind of sore. And it's usually after I've done a lot, like tomorrow I'm probably going to be pretty sore. But it's because I got baby deer knees. Like I haven't used them in a while. And it's like they kind of take a little longer to recoup. That's, I mean, that's just the God's honest truth. And I full on believe, if you want my honest opinion, I bet you, I, I can't say I bet you because I would love to be pleasantly surprised by this. But if I went and took x-rays of my knees with my orthopedist, they'd probably show bone on bone. They probably do. Because the revelation I've had about my healing is, is that I'm holding on to it. It's not mine yet. The king is away, the master's away, and he wants to know what I'm going to do with it. I'm stewarding this miracle right now. So I can walk. I feel good. I don't hurt, but my knees still pop. My shoulder gets locked up sometimes. And I feel like that's the Lord saying, what are you going to do with it? Are we going back to... No, sir, never again. I'm holding on to this miracle, and I have to steward it. Now, for me, that means I have to take responsibility for that power. So what is it that I can do for my miracle? Well, I can make sure this shirt gets a little looser. And I have. 65 pounds down, baby. 
And it's hard. It's almost never fun. <laughs> Rice and beans. Chicken and broccoli. I texted my health coach. I, have a, I pay a guy to keep me accountable because I know myself. And I know that I've lost weight before. And it never stuck. And it's different this time. I feel like I'm on a holy crusade from the Lord himself. I just accidentally closed out my message. I don't know if that's a sign from the Holy Spirit or what, but I'm done. I feel like this is a command from the Lord to steward the miracle that he gave me three months ago. Sometimes... We don't see the miracle because maybe there's a stewarding period that we haven't engaged in yet. Or maybe it's because we have begun stewarding it, but we haven't seen the process through to the end. Maybe we're on that sixth time around Jericho. Maybe we've dunked six times in the Jordan River. And maybe the Lord is just saying, are you willing to go the distance? Are you willing to steward it fully? Maybe, and like I said, this is the heaviest part of this revelation for me, the heaviest part of stewarding the miracle is that maybe you and I need to go back to the cross of Calvary and we need to take responsibility for what took place that day. That it was for our salvation, it was for our healing that Jesus took those stripes. He doesn't need to do it again Maybe we just need to go back and take responsibility. Here's the end. Here's the hook, right? Christ has given each of us a piece of his wealth, a piece of the kingdom. He's died and he's rose again for our salvation. Hebrews 9.28 says, So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people he will he will come again not to deal with our sins because he did that but to bring salvation to all who eagerly wait for him we have all heard of the free gift of salvation but really that means that you didn't have to pay for it that's all it means the gift of salvation was not free it cost the life of Jesus, the Son of God who never did anything wrong. He was bruised and beaten so that we could be healed, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Some of us have been believing for healing in our bodies in our lives or in the lives of our loved ones, but what is the responsibility that we must take so that we can steward that miracle? Is it like me? Is it losing weight and getting healthy? Or are you one of the four friends that has to carry your paralyzed friend to Jesus? Or have you been healed and refused to carry your mattress home so you still fight the paralysis from before? He's given us his spirit that we might have power over the enemy. Romans 8, 11 says, The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God has raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by, his, by the same spirit living within you. This one takes on a lot of different meanings to me. I feel like people desire the miracle ministries of these the, the, the big-time greats in the Bible. Elisha calling down fire and consuming the altar. People believed that Peter's shadow passing over them would heal them. The disciples speaking in tongues and prophesying, and everyone who gathered heard it in their own language. Casting out demons. 
speaking. How many of you guys have like, I've done this so many times in my life, gone outside and just spoke to the wind and the rain? People ask for that kind of power from the Holy Spirit to work through them all the time. But are we willing to steward that power and do the necessary things to see that power made manifest? Because i got to be honest with you, you can't watch Game of Thrones on Friday night and then speak to the hurricane coming on Saturday. I don't know why I picked on Game of Thrones. But you can't go drinking at the bar on Saturday night and wake up Sunday morning and pray for your friend or your husband or your son to get saved. That's not how the power of the Holy Spirit works. You have to steward that anointing. You have to steward that miracle. you got to put in the time praying and fasting for days and days and days. You want the ministry of John the Baptist? Then eat locusts and wild honey. I'm not saying, like, it's causal, right? I'm talking about the sacrifice that John the Baptist made, the fast that he endured to slay his body so that the Lord could work. Being so immersed in the word of God that you can pull scripture out at any moment. Giving up those certain comforts in life that we cling to so much that can actually drive a wedge between you and the Lord. Those relationships, those, but he said he loved me, but I love her. Whatever. I told you, I'm an old youth pastor. Like The amount of times a young man was in my office and was like, but Pastor Jay, I love her. Okay. The funniest thing was that's how I'd answer them too. They'd be like, oh, yeah, you do? No, you don't. You're 12. I'm sorry. <laughs> the people that don't observe those steps but, but cry out to the Lord for that power for that ability, for that, that closeness to him, but refuse to pray, refuse to fast, refuse to be in the word, refuse to give up those comforts in our lives to fast and sacrifice for the Holy Spirit to move. Those are like that third servant who took and stewarded what God did for them, but then went and hid it in the ground instead so that they, they could go and do something else. That's who, that's who is a steward, but not necessarily such a good one. Christ commands that we steward the sacrifice that he made until he returns. And he's going to return for his bride and he's going to take us home. And pastor's going to come and he's going to close us out. I think I'm a couple minutes behind, but. I want you to ask. I want you to ask the Lord, what is the process What's the cost? What's the price? What is the responsibility that you must take in order to be trusted by the king of kings with your miracle? What does it mean to steward your miracle personally? What does it mean to steward the miracle of the person that you've been praying for? Ask the question and allow him to answer.